So the final paper, we're back to a short paper again now, is from Newcastle University. It's from um, Emily Dot, academic liaison librarian, and also Terry Charlton, who's the Learning Enhancement and Technology Team Manager. And you can see on your screens now, it's about AI, which is the hot topic at the moment, isn't it? Uh, certainly in, in HE, it's, it's what we seem to talk about in our department, particularly as I'm in a computer and information sciences department. Um, but generative AI, uh, meeting the challenges and embracing the opportunities for student learning. So uh, we're, we're going back to the library user again, and in this particular context, students. But again, it could be something that could be applied in a wider context as well. So sit back, relax, and let's hear what, uh, what um, Emily and Terry have to say. I can see Terry's there already. Emily might be as well, but I can't yep. see her on my screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm here too. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. okay. Um, hopefully you can all see my slides okay. Um, so thanks, Biddy. We are going to be um, talking about AI, and mostly this is going to be a little bit of a story, is how I would describe it. Um, so at Newcastle University, our unit is called Academic Services. So that's made up of the University Library and the Learning and Teaching Development Service. Um, I'm the librarian for computing and engineering, and although I am quite a tech-savvy librarian, I am definitely not an AI expert. Terry, on the other hand, um, has a computing science background and sits within LTDS, and he manages learning enhancement and technology. So he's responsible for all things ed tech in the university, so has a little bit um, more professional interest in AI than I do, potentially. Um, we were very lucky to have Terry in the library with us for a number of years. Um, so he is actually one of our best advocates and I would say understands our role a bit um, slightly better than other colleagues in terms of our role beyond collections and the buildings. So our joint approach to the challenges of AI is an excellent example of how the two sides of our service complement each other and allow us to work together to shape a university-wide approach in what is quite a high stakes topic and is rapidly changing. So we're gonna tell you our story, um, why the two of us somewhat accidentally became involved in the creation of principles and advice around the topic of AI. And it's something that has caused quite a lot of anxious conversations in our institution and beyond. So how as a service, we have very rapidly responded to the expectations of our organization to lead and advise on the challenges and opportunities presented by AI. And pretty much in summary, I blame Terry for getting me involved. Um, not necessarily in a negative way, but it is entirely his fault. So my story with AI, um, begins sort of in earnest on a Friday morning in December when Terry shared a reflective piece of writing with me that he said a colleague was submitting for fellowship of advanced HC and that's not an unusual sort of request because I tend to have um, lots of opinions let's put it that way um, having read it I wasn't particularly impressed but I was trying not to be too critical so I said yep I thought it would pass but it needed some refinement um, it very much read like a list of facts, a bit like a CV, and in my opinion was overly descriptive, descriptive when I would have been looking for sort of more reflection and evaluation of practice. It was only an hour later after me trying to be kind, um, but thinking that the whole application was pretty terrible, that Terry admitted that it wasn't actually real and he generated the content using ChatGPT. And at that point, a slight sense of panic definitely kicked in for me because it was immediately obvious what the implications were for this. Can you hear us all right? Am I? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, yeah, and, and sorry for the AI-generated fellowship submission. I feel a bit guilty about that now for tricking you, but uh, you know. Um, I'd spent about six months writing my own one a year earlier. Um, and this one, the one I sent to Emily, they had generated between two stops on the train to work. So I think it was a, important for things to come. Um, so JackGPT, um, it's hard to believe, but at the start of the year, nobody really knew what it was. Uh, 
now everybody is talking about it and every university is scratching their heads trying to work out how to react to it. Um, a bit of background, ChatGPT was released by a company called OpenAI at the start of last year, and it arguably represents a massive leap really for how we use artificial intelligence in our everyday lives. Um, none of this is new, by the way. We've been using AI for ages. Um, we've got Siri on our iPhones, we've got Alexa, Google Assistant. Um, these are all extremely sophisticated, natural language AI tools, as they're called. Um, and there's also kind of recommendation engines like uh, the ones inside of Netflix or Amazon, you know, which kind of recommend the next thing to watch. So these are all AI driven. Um, what ChatGPT and its ilk have done is take this one step further. Um, they've trained the AI on a much larger data set, uh, tens of thousands of books, uh, journals, web articles, and then added this kind of conversational and freely available front end to the AI that anybody can use, uh, anyone being me, you, our students, and the press, <laughs> which is what's generated such a new storm really in recent months about uh, AI. It's really helped push this AI text generation into the mainstream. It's been around for years, really. Um, but yeah, it's very popular these days. Um, if you've never used ChatGPT before, and I would encourage you to, if you haven't, um, give it a go. It's very impressive. It can write essays on pretty much any subject you give it. It can draw and paint pictures. It can explain com uh, complex concepts so just for tone and audience, generate poetry, um, perform data analysis. You name it, it can do it. Um, I'm a computer scientist by trade. It can run computer code, uh, write computer code as well, which does it better than I can. So I'm glad I've shifted jobs in the last couple of years. Um, it can help with interview questions, recommend investment strategies. It's quite something. Um, and unlike Google search, it's conversational. So unlike a search engine, uh, where you can talk to it like a real person, um, or oh, this sort of remembers what you've said, it picks up on the nuances of your, your speech, the way you talk to it, and it can adjust this responses based on the natural flow of your chat. Um, and it's not alone. Next slide, please, Emily. Hey, I always want to say that. Um, the majority of AI news coverage and speculation is about chat GPT. That's one we always hear about. But this is a very fast moving market and new text generation and image generation tools are being released all the time. Um, I'm just going to turn off my uh, there we go. teams. It's binging away there and driving us nuts. So Dolly and Midjourney are two image generation tools. You type the prompt in, uh, the system draws a picture for you in whatever style you want. So just <laughs> it's on the screen now, just before this webinar, I asked it for a picture of a Yorkshire Terrier in a gingham dress wearing army boots, you know, trying to trip it up, and yet it has a good go at it. You know, it's not, it's not perfect, but it's not bad either. It's certainly better than I can do in, in five seconds. Um, but it's also capable of doing a, a whole lot more. So there's just two images generated by Midjourney. Quite impressive, uh, I think you'll agree. Um, stick in a prompt, can you show me a faceted lion? Five seconds later, there you go. Um, and it gives you sort of five different versions as well, so you can pick your favorite one. Really, really quite impressive what it can do. Um, Microsoft have recently released an AI-enhanced Bing search as well, which you may have heard about. Um, this has boosted Bing from and also ran to a credible front runner when it comes to AI powered search. Um, later to the show, as usual, Google has also released something called BARD. Both of them work in very much the same way as ChatGPT. You type in a prompt and it returns kind of conversational text back at you. Um, I would say BARD has a slightly better capacity to search the internet and understand the results it gets as well. Um, so when writing res responses, um, I feel it's a little bit more on the academic side as well than ChatGPT, which feels a little bit more on the um, at the web copy side of things, um, like writing articles and whatnot. And there's plenty of other AI tools in the horizon too, um, which we're only now really starting to become aware of, start, starting to pick up steam. Um, and saying that, it feels like every day there's a new platform or version of a system that's released or a new third party plug into those systems. Um, I'm signed up to a weekly what's happened in AI newsletter and the pace of change is absolutely phenomenal. Um, 
never in my 20 odd years of work in, in IT and education have I seen anything like it. It's it's quite something. It feels like the early days of the internet in some ways, you know, where I don't think about happening in years. Now they feel as though they're happening in days with AI. Um, pace of change is unreal. And there's a, a little uh, box in the bottom right there, Microsoft 365 Core Pilot sitting among, amongst the others. But really, I see this as being the next game changer in AI. Um, at the moment, you need to go to an AI platform and do something with it to generate text. This technology is being built into Office right now. Um, if you remember Clippy, you know, think, think, looks like you're writing a letter. <laughs> uh, by the end of the year, Copilot will have this kind of essay writing AI built into it. Um, it'll be evaluating the text that you write, suggesting improvements with the ability to rewrite everything you write as well. Um, so you could say, like, take my writing, but make it more academic or create me a PowerPoint for a presentation on AI with 10 slides. Whoosh, off it goes. Look at this Excel data, analyze it. Maybe a pie chart of the highlights. So yeah, I think that would be quite a quite a big game changer. So um, yeah, I strongly believe that we all need to maintain a strong and live position on AI, adapt the AI technologies as they evolve, um, and help each other do that as well, and help spread best practice whenever we can. Um, yeah, Emily, over to you. So many of the conversations that we've been having um, within the university have very much got an undertone of fear about them. Um, one of the first meetings I went to just after ChatGPT had been um, released, one of the very senior academic colleagues in the room just happened to declare in passing, totally unconnected to the discussion in the meeting, that all written assessment was now redundant unless we returned to closed book in-person handwritten exams and that sort of just illustrated the immediate kind of knee-jerk reaction that was happening which was well we've just got to go back to never using a computer ever again and partly those anxieties I think are rooted in the speed of development as Terry's described so just when you think you understand the limitations so the example of that bit of writing that I read I could Im immediately see that it wasn't correctly written in a reflective style and then chat gpt4 came along and then that changed our understanding of the limitations and for us as information professionals there may also be some fears around our role and relevance in this age of ai generated information if you can just put a prompt in chat into chat gpt and it gives you the answer what is the point of all of our subscriptions what is the point of um, having print resources if they then can't be interrogated by something um, that like ChatGPT. But in this sort of anxious environment, it's really, really important to remember um, that there was a time when, we, when Wikipedia was a major cause of concern or when um, e-resources and Google searching was sort of indicated as being the end of print collections or the death of libraries altogether. So this um, growth of AI is simply the most recent development, and we need to embrace it as professionals, in my opinion, in order to be able to position ourselves as um, leaders and advocates and educators. So as the words around generative AI spread, um, we began to hear a lot around the library being mentioned in the conversation. Um, so in a number of institutional meetings, the question was asked, well, what is the library doing about ChatGPT? And while that's great that we're in that institutional consciousness, it brought many challenges for us and quite a bit of stress, to be honest, as a team, as we were unsure how to respond. It was something that we knew we needed to do really, really quickly, but where do you even start? And similarly, Terry's team were being looked to for solutions around assessment, plagiarism, curriculum design that we just didn't have any answers for at all. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm mean, just taking the stuff into the chat there. <laughs> um, however you look at it, um, for me anyway, I think the emergence of AI is something of a, of a game changer. Um, it will significantly impact how we teach and assess in, in FE and EHE, absolutely. Um, so to stay relevant, what we at Newcastle have done is we've decided we need to adapt and rethink how we use these AI tools ourselves, and more so how we can help our students make best use of them. Um, students are already using this technology in their studies. We know that. 
Um, I work in a side library and as I walk across the floor, students are all on their computers. At any one time, I would say a good half of them are on ChatGPT. Um, it's being used massively. Um, so yeah, students are using this. But more importantly, they'll also be using this technology in the workplace when they graduate. And so we really need to prepare them, I think, for that reality. And we ourselves need to embrace the use of the AI rather than seek the ban it. So how do we do that? Just next slide. Um, to get the ball rolling, our Dean of Digital Education, he has worked with academic leads across the university to create five principles for the use of AI at Newcastle, um, which was the easy bit, really. The implementation of those principles has proven to be a lot harder um, and has required a lot of coordinated effort between us, us being the TEL team where I am and um, the library's um, liaison team who are developing more of the student focus games. We tend to work more on the staff side, but obviously there's a lot, a lot of crossover between the two. Um, and yeah, thank goodness for that collaborative approach and having such a cracking team on both sides because I'm not lying, it's been quite hard work getting our heads around all of this. Um, and the burden of kind of having to respond quickly to AI and implement our institutional response. We're having to do this on top of an already pretty hectic day job. So it's been exhausting. Um, at some point, the promise of all this IT and its ability to help reduce our workloads will come true, but it doesn't seem to be coming along anytime soon. Anyway, I'll stop mentioning about that and get back to the five principles of AI, which Emily will introduce. So as Terry said, we're not currently seeking to ban the use of AI at Newcastle University. I cannot promise that anything we say today is going to be the same um, when we come to September. But currently we are not banning the use of AI and we're very much committed to offer our students support on guidance on how to use it responsibly and ethically. And that's really where we've come in within the library and academic skills team um, by beginning to develop a suite of student facing AI literacy resources, which we're hosting on something that we call the academic skills kit. So the web pages were created by myself and a colleague from the academic skills team, and we've created a section of the website to introduce AI and the potential positive use of the tools for learning. So the pages explain how to reference and acknowledge AI correctly, how to stay on the right side of appropriate use. The guidance itself sits within a section focused on good academic practice alongside advice on plagiarism and referencing, because we wanted to bring in that kind of positive use in the first instance, rather than going straight down the idea of cheating. Um, there is more of the kind of policy sounding, sounding content and advice on academic integrity, but we also begin to touch on the potential use and benefits for academic skills development. The pages went live a little over a month ago and initially it only saw kind of so steady usage. That's increased significantly over the past week due to an increased promotion and um, potentially a student newspaper article about it on Friday, which saw us get the same amount of use in one day as we had for the previous three weeks. So our first principle is very much about that supporting um, advice and guidance in order to make um, informed decisions about the use of AI. The second principle is more about the how to do that in practice. So the use of AI should be transparent and acknowledged. And that is really an area where everybody looked to the library for advice. So we immediately started getting questions about how do you reference um, AI? But in terms of acknowledgement, it goes far beyond referencing. So we have um, put out the guidance that whenever AI is used, to contribute to a piece of work, its use should be acknowledged. So that's not just about citing um, ChatGPT content as a source of information. It's more about how AI has been used in order to generate that um, work. So that might be by um, asking ChatGPT to outline an essay structure. It might be using ChatGPT to give you some key topics to go and explore. It might be using ChatGPT to suggest some sources to go and read. But that um, level of kind of 
starting point um, using AI also needs to be acknowledged, not just if it's been used as a source. So we've advised students to include a sort of statement or declaration whenever AI has been used. And it's very much about also including um, a very transparent outline of the prompts that we used in the assignment. And that can either be um, included as full in full as an appendix to the assignment, or potentially it could be um, a summary if it's part of a larger conversation. So again, we've used the academic skills kit to provide this advice. And I have to be quite honest, we largely made it up. I spent quite a lot of time thinking, is this actually what we are asking students to do? Because it is a huge amount of potential work to acknowledge exactly the prompts you've done. And particularly when we were aware that this was at the end of a lot of the dissertation project work for our students. Um, we almost immediately sent questions to Bloomsbury to ask if they were putting information in Cite Them Right Online about how to reference AI. And thankfully they now have, which has been really, really valuable. So a, a, an interesting challenge in this work has been very much about getting some sort of formal approval or agreement that this is in fact our institutional approach. And I'm still waiting for somebody to turn around and tell me I'm wrong. But what seems to be happening at the minute is that people are coming to us with more and more questions and asking us to be the voice of authority, which puts us in a little bit of a, a difficult position, I think. Your turn, Terry. Thanks, Emily. Um, yes, so this one's one of mine because it sort of rests a little bit more on the staff side of things, but yeah, AI should not be able to um, pass a module or a course. Um, easy for me to say. In a sentence, it's not acceptable for students to use AI tools to write entire assessment submissions from start to finish. Um, to do so would be considered academic misconduct, just as it would be if a student had copied somebody else's work or used an essay writing service or something. Um, and we already have our academic misconduct procedures in place to deal with that. Um, but we don't like to think of principle three here in terms of a, a deficit model. You know, we're not trying to carry on as normal and spend our time trying to detect and catch out students who've used AI. Instead, we're trying, or instead we're accepting really that the essay is on shaky ground maybe, and or instead looking for ways to AI proof our assignments and assessments going forward. Um, so where AI can be used to pass an assignment or a module, our colleagues are being encouraged to reconsider their assessment design. I absolutely appreciate that this will not always be easy. It may not always be possible, uh, but we need as a university to, to maintain confidence and reliability in our assessment outcomes. And therefore, we all sort of collectively need to get creative and find robust and authentic ways to engineer out AI from our assessments. Um, as I say, this is not a trivial task. So what we've done is we've built a range of staff facing resources to help with that, along with two webinars. Uh, webinars slash workshops, which we are using to help colleagues think about their assessment designs. We introduced them to AI because a lot haven't even seen it sort of working really. Um, so we showed, showed people how it works, what it does. Uh, we encourage them to put in their essay questions, uh, see what comes back. Many are quite shocked by how good and how passable a reply they get uh, with very little effort. We uh, try and encourage people to identify AI yeah, weaknesses in their assignments think about ways to fill them to ensure that that academic rigor. Emily. So I'm going to power through these as we're running out of time. Mm. Um, so we, as Terry mentioned before, we're very much coming from the perspective of positive use being encouraged and recognizing that for us in our workplaces, for students in their future employability, they are going to need to make use of these tools. So the resources we have so far on the academic skills kit are very basic because we had to focus on the upcoming assessment period. But the next steps for us are to focus on um, positive use of AI and, and sort of that digital assistant aspect. So in the next phase, we're going to um, be looking at the value of AI in the writing process. So not writing something for you, but as an assistant in the writing process. And from an information literacy perspective, we're looking at um, evaluation, critical reading and effective information seeking. 
as Terry said, we also are kind of recognizing that this is changing on an almost daily basis. And we are looking to try and keep up with how AI technologies are evolving. So we fully expect that those web pages are going to need extensive updates over the summer. Um, so whatever comes out of this assessment period, I imagine we're going to have to change our guidance a little bit. Um, within the university, we're trying to build a community approach. So recognizing that we need to help each other through this. Um, in terms of answering inquiries, I'm seeing that as quite a kind of maybe having a group of us who discuss what the answer is before we get to the point of saying, yes, this is OK, this is not. And we're sort of trying to look for ways we can spread best practice. So for us in the library, that very much means some rapid upskilling. So for myself in uh, the coming months, I'm going to be focusing on prompt engineering and the development of advice around effective information seeking, drawing on AI, um, mostly because we've already advertised a workshop on that topic in July. And at the minute, I have no idea what I'm going to say. But by July, I will have a workshop in place. We're also very much moving towards proactive advocacy. So it includes a lot of staff and student communications, the workshops that Terry's already mentioned, development of um, more student facing resources. So even just having um, information on our university digital signage and posters, trying to direct students to the advice that's out there for them. Over to you, Terry. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's funny you should say prompt engineering. I came across a couple of jobs this morning for a prompt engineer. So blame me, it's a new world we're entering. Um, so AI and education are the possible. Um, I just want to mention that another internal event that we're running at Newcastle, um, or the possible week, it's dedicated to AI. Um, it's a week long event. And we've got guest speakers talking about how they use AI in other institutions, as well as demonstrations from colleagues at this university on how they're using it already in their teaching and assessment. Um, and we'll probably be running our webinars and workshops that I mentioned earlier a few more times in person too. Um, but this event is very much a collaborative effort with staff from our uh, essentially our tell team here, working with colleagues across the library. Um, that's the whole university as well. So that's kind of us. Um, on behalf of myself and Emily, I can speak for Emily, I'm sure. Thank you for coming along and listening to us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Terry and Emily. Um, yeah, <clears throat> it's an area very close to my, um, my own experiences at the moment, having just marked some work where actually one of the pieces of work, so we have a turn in uh, AI detection tool and uh, that sort of got me a bit suspicious but then when I looked into it this idea of fake references is really interesting how it's generating them um, and I don't know that the students necessarily realize this <laughs> yeah so uh, we'll just have to see but it's constantly evolving you yeah. know week by week it's so it's it really is a very tricky thing so thank you very much for that really interesting talk so we've got a bit of time for questions and Jenny is ready and raring so over yep. to you um so Terry's been very helpfully answering some of them in the chat as we go but just for the recording um Angela asked about whether chat G GPT can write reflectively he said it's not great but it is getting better and better all the time it can certainly have a go at simulating it um, and a question about whether AI could be used to bait, bypass plagiarism issues um, and that, yes, potentially you could drop that plagiarised text into it and say, rewrite this for me. Yeah. Um, there's been a few requests for a link to the AI newsletter that you mentioned, Terry, if you want to put that into the chat later on, that'd be great. Um, maybe we can add it to the thing we send out to everyone after the event. Yeah, of course. Um, people are very impressed by your principles for the use of AI. Um, so, Emily, is it academic colleagues asking you for advice or just students? Both. So on Friday, I asked, uh, received an inquiry from an academic where they were trying to advise their student about whether it was acceptable to um, put the work they'd created through an, an AI tool in order to improve the academic language. Um, so we are also we're getting questions from all over the place. And I think one of the issues we're still working out is how best to handle those because I think um, 
there was maybe an assumption from some of our more senior colleagues that the point at which we would hear about AI was going to be where somebody had done something wrong. Whereas based on our experience of dealing with students in one-to-one -one in situations and the support we provide in the library, it's at an earlier stage in the preparation of their assignment. So we often get students saying, am I going to be accused of plagiarism if I submit this? Well, yes, potentially, no, potentially. Write it in a more academic style, put your citations in, you can avoid plagiarism. Um, so I think that's where we're going to get the most questions from is a, an early question in the writing process or in the submission process of am I allowed to do this or am I going to be accused of cheating it's interesting you say about um turn it in Biddy we do not my right in saying Terry we are yeah, not using not. the AI checker in turn it in yeah um so there are the approach being taken by the institution is that no academic colleague is to put um, a piece of student work through an AI checker. It is taken through the formal process of um, the assessment irregularities. So it's taken up by our student progress team rather than individual colleagues. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's interesting because yes, it, it's an. I, I, I mean, just mm -hmm. I, I don't know the full policy, but at Northumbria, it's interesting because students have to submit, turn mm -hmm. it in. And it's actually an added bolt on that's now appeared, um, yeah. which confuses me sometimes because, you know, it's it's not always I, I don't know. I don't know enough about what's going on behind it to know what exactly it's spotting. It's been useful in a few um, instances for me. Yeah, um, but I don't know. I don't know enough about it to know. Ooh. I won't let get I won't let Terry get started on this because you will. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, we turned it off because we were, uh, yeah, very unsure about it, but also yeah. we were concerned about huge levels, very high levels of false positives as well. Yeah, so we joined yeah. a lot of other each institutions, a lot of the Russell groups, and just were, were asked to uh, turn it in, uh, turn it off. Yeah. That, that was a, um, a hashtag that was trending on Twitter for a little while. Hashtag turn it off, which I yeah. thought was quite good. But, uh, well, I think there, as an academic, you are having to use your judgment. Yeah. So although it's there as a tool, I mean, it's a bit like turn it in it's, yeah. as a tool for plagiarism. You have to sort of use other judgments as well to try and yeah. work out whether it's helpful. But I agree with you that, yes, it, it can be a little bit confusing. Yeah. And that's definitely why we're going down the route of education and advocacy on this, because like everybody's commenting about references and the quality of the information comes through. That's where I see a big role for the library is in that same sort of conversation that we were having about Wikipedia as a source. You know, it, it's, it's that critical evaluation of it as an information source in its own right. And especially in the academic environment where it's not drawing on resources that are behind a paywall. So trying to think of it as a, as a resource that can be used as part of the process, yeah. but actually bringing it back to it is your work that needs to be submitted. Yeah. Okay, question for Terry. Are you collaborating with other HE institutions on the principles and are you sharing with other colleges, for instance, um, to give this information to say FE colleges? Yeah, I, I just pressed enter on the reply there. Um, so I'll, I'll read it, I'll read it back out, Jenny. Um, yeah, so our deans, um, the We've got a, a Dean of Digital Education at the University as well as the um, Education Deans and they collectively wrote the high level principles, the sort of five principles, and they did that in collaboration with other Russell Group unions. But we found that was the easy bit, you know, it's, it's the, the detail of it, the implementation of it has kind of fell largely to us in uh, the Learning and Teaching Development Service and the, you know, what's effectively our tell team and our library colleagues to do this kind of student facing stuff. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how it's come about. We are we sharing with FE colleges, probably not in any major way. This stuff is published on the website, so it's kind of freely available, but uh, not making any mm -hmm. huge efforts to do so. I don't think, unless I don't the library does, but uh, no, no, no. I think that is something that we had discussed with David about kind of how how we get to a point of it being more national discussions and decisions about some yeah. of this because it's all well and good us saying we're not banning it here some universities have the yeah. experience you have if you moved from undergraduate to pgt would be very different depending where you've come from so it it does need to be a bigger conversation it does, does. now i'm not too sure we're confident enough 
no. that we're right to sort of tell people about it, you know, because, yeah, I, I think Emily or maybe somebody before I mentioned, like, we're making this up as we're cool. We're, we're, we're not exactly, but it does feel like that. Uh-huh. And I think because of that, we're lacking the confidence to at least broadcast it more widely. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been some questions about your Newcastle event that you were advertising the art of the possible and whether they any of the talks from that might be available to people outside Newcastle Uni after the event. Yeah, no, sorry. What we're doing there was, um, yeah, I, I tried to online internal, but I, I think I uh, probably didn't do a good enough job. So what we're doing there is it's a, an in-person event that's happening on, on site and it's designed purely just to try and get academic staff engaged um, and try and get uh, people just to buy into AI and realise that they have to do something about it. But uh, yeah, just we're going to just try and wrap it up in a little bit more of a and like a weekly kind of event and it runs at the same time as the three rivers as well there was sort of people are presenting stuff there and they're doing stuff at ours and it's just a bit of a kind of a collaborative effort but very much newcastle focused i'm afraid because i think it does uh, in a lot of the, the sessions i do in the workshops and the webinars i try and encourage people to talk about this in their schools um but i think this is sort of raising it just that one step higher and talking about it across the schools across the faculties but as a as an institution, yeah. So unfortunately, not. No, it's not really anything that's open to the wider world. Sorry. Um, I think we're getting there. One last one about uh, copyright issues and pre-published documents, where someone's saying that her colleagues are worried about sharing research before publication in case it's used in AI. Yep. Interesting. Yep. <laughs> so we we've been having the conversation about copyright um in our team um one of my colleagues attended the Silip copyright conference last mm-hmm. monday so um it's a thing that we're still very early on in our thinking about i have no idea is my absolute answer on that um <clears throat> but it's the sort of thing that i think is in terms of Silip, i think there's quite a role for us to be able to share those kind of have those conversations in a safe environment so it's it feels like something an event like this is probably the place where that sort of thing can happen um without any of us feeling like we're missing like we don't have the knowledge or without feeling like we're putting something out there that then comes back to bite us in uh, a student newspaper for example has mm-hmm. happened to us this week yes Okay, well, back over to you, Biddy. 